Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the Executive Director of the University of Chicago Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong. Our premier location in Asia, representing UChicago values of free and open discourse, rigorous debate, and the exchange of ideas. Welcome to the POP Asia series. We're sharing tonight's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube from the University of Chicago UN campus in Hong Kong. If audience members have questions to submit, you can do so through the questions and answer button by first registering on Zoom. I also encourage you to visit our website at www.uchicago.hk and subscribe to our e-news for the latest news and information. Or you can also follow us on Facebook and our newly launched UChicago UN campus accounts on Instagram and Twitter. GGN, our UChicago study abroad program manager and special projects coordinator working closely with me during COVID will wrap up tonight's program with a poll and more information about upcoming events you may be interested in. So please be sure to stay tuned until the very end of the program. The Pop Asia series takes on cultural topics that originate in Asia and impact the rest of the world. Tonight, we begin a new Pop Asia mini series covering the Korean wave, where we'll explore one of the major cultural exports sweeping the globe from South Korea, Korean pop music or K-pop. K-pop has surged in popularity over the past few years, fostering millions of loyal fans worldwide. It's especially known for its vibrant music videos and elaborate performances that include singing and group dancing. It's become a global force, especially as K-pop songs have held top positions on billboard charts, broken viewing records on YouTube and achieved sold out stadium concerts. While the pandemic has forced the K-pop industry to do even more online to engage with fans using new non-traditional means, the industry continues to expand and attract new fans. But how was K-pop able to adapt to these changes so quickly? And how has the digitization of fandom impacted the way fans interact with their idols and with each other? Finally, what does all this mean for the future of the Korean music industry? Our guests tonight provide insights on these and many other questions. So let's get started with brief introductions of our guest speakers tonight. Dr. Rebecca Chioko King Orian is a senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology at Maynooth University in the Republic of Ireland. Her research interests are in popular culture, globalization, emotions and technology, race and ethnic beauty pageants, and critical mixed race studies. Her current research explores globalized interpersonal and interactive forms of bodily culture in Asia and Europe and Asian popular culture, including Korean and Japanese popular music and dramas and digital technology. Dr. Jimian Park is a visiting lecturer at Sciences Po Paris, France, and a researcher at the Institute of Communication Research at Seoul National University, Korea. He's published academic articles and conducted research projects related to competitiveness of organizations, industries, and countries. One of those projects focused on the digital transformation of the Korean music industry and the global emergence of K-pop. Dr. Park's main research topics are on strategies of different business systems and cultures with historical approaches. And finally, we're doing something a little different for this series tonight. We have Jenna Gibson, a PhD student in the Department of Political Science at the University of Chicago, who will moderate the program. In the additional resources link on our event page, You'll see that Jenna was featured in a New Yorker magazine video discussing her views on K-pop. I urge you to check that out. Jenna's research interests include media effects, political communication, and public and cultural diplomacy. Jenna is a regular contributor to the Korean column for The Diplomat and has also written about Korean social issues for foreign policy. Before pursuing her doctorate, Jenna was a director of communications at the Korea Economic Institute of America and has previously lived in Cheonan, South Korea for two years as a Fulbright English teaching assistant. 
Jenna, thanks for putting this program together and for joining us tonight. I'll turn the program over to you and your guests to get us started. Um, thanks so much, Mark, uh, for the great introduction and good morning from Chicago. Um, hopefully we have a lot of uh, viewers coming in from all over the world um, and that you can enjoy this great discussion that we're able to have over Zoom um, today. So I really want to just jump right in. We have a lot of great questions that have come in from people registering for the event. And again, I really encourage you to use the Q&A function on Zoom. If you have questions, we will get to those towards the end. But just to start us off, I want to first go to Dr. Park. Can you give us a bit of a background on how we got here? Um, how did the K-pop industry handle technological change over time? And did that make it easier for them to go fully online during the COVID pandemic? Jenna, okay, this is a very interesting question and this is very important to understand. Okay, um, I think it, the best way to talk about it, actually, I have a video clip that I would like to share with you. Back in 2001, you said this to your staff. You said, we don't make music, we make stars. Why, why did you say that? What, what were you driving at there? Uh, I mean, I have to confess that it wasn't because I was smart. It was just because I was forced to. 80% uh, of Korean computers were high-speed cable connected. So when the Napster type of programs came out, it hit Korea the most fastest and most severely. So we lost 90% of the physical CD market. So I had no choice but to change our business model. So, okay, now when everything's turning digital, where should I go? So my thought was, what's the most analog thing in the world is human being. So no matter what happens on the way how we distribute music, the fact that a star, we need a star, would never change. So that was my safest bet to concentrate on the human beings. So I got all my employees in the auditorium and said, okay, from today, we don't make music, we make stars. So our final product is not music, but human beings. As soon as Right, so basically this guy is Park Jin Yong. So he's one of the you know, famous CEO in Korean uh, music industry. So the interesting thing is like, you know, instead of just he focusing on digitization of Korean music industry, he said, because of the fast internet and then computer, he said 90% of physical album sales collapsed in Korea. So basically, if you just cannot, you should not point out digitization in order to explain the success of Korean music industry. That means basically you have to think about so many different things. Um, well, just like other, you know, Asian countries, such as like China and Hong Kong, also, you know, many, many uh, Southeast Asian countries, Korea didn't have really well uh, developed copyright system. I mean, as a member of OECD country, Korea should have um, good, you know, copyright. However, before, you know, people didn't respect, respect it. And then album sales, it did not work. So basically what they have to do is, you know, try to focus on video. I mean, television at the time, okay? So this is why, you know, K-pop music industry, they focus a lot on dance, cosmetic, and outfit and dress, and this kind of things. Of course, also there's another thing which is very important. You have to, you should not forget that it's globalization. A lot of people, they try to explain that, you know, K-pop and Korea and then K-pop is from Korea. But, you know, you have to think about one thing, you know, the music we do, what we call in you know, K-pop, it is not really Korean traditional music. It is like a mixture of a bunch of different things, mainly from the United States. And also we have a lot of influence from uh, Japan and uh, other countries. Of course, there's uh, something, you know, from Korea. So basically we mix around and we globalize, you know, everything. And then this is one thing, you know, you have to think about it. Another one is like a digitization. And then also this one is related to social network services and then streaming. And then if you understand the internet, actually this is not really Korea specific, which means basically Japan, United States, France, you know, Hong Kong and China, if they like, they can utilize this kind of medium in order to diffuse their music, okay? Then you have to think about then why Korean music industry 
you know, they really, they are really willing to use this kind of medium. Okay. Back to the, you know, the previously, previous story. Actually, this is much related to copyright. Okay. So at state level, we maintain the copyright, you know, the level of copyright, just like other OECD countries. However, if the copyright holder, okay, does not want to exercise copyright, then this is a totally different story. Okay, the Korean music industry, especially the companies, they are willing to share their music with others. They, they don't care much about the copyright because you know, in the era of this digestion, they know that the diffusion is the most important thing. They cannot make you know profits out of sales of physical album anymore. Okay, so they are willing to incorporate this digestion, and they don't care about they don't care much about you know copyright. And they globalize everything. This is why you know we mix around the English lyrics. Sometimes we hire people from Thailand, United States, you know, China, and then you can see you know this kind of thing happening, and then it helps the Korean music industry to you know emerge globally. Great. So then I want to move over to um, Dr. King Orian. What impact has has this had on fit on fans themselves? So we talked a lot about you know kind of changes in copyright, changes in digitization um, on the industry side, but then fans obviously have changed a lot as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think um, you know there there are kind of three components or elements here. I mean, first of course are the production corporations, which Dr. Park just spoke about, um, but you know, big companies that get public and private capital actually invested in them, who recruit young talent, sign them to long contracts. Um, artists actually don't make that much money um, off of the music. Um, and a lot of the kind of profits are plowed back into the company in terms of development. And so I think it, it, it's an interesting developmental model for corporations. That's the first piece. The second piece, of course, is technology. Um, and the third piece, of course, are the fans themselves. And I would argue the emotions of fans are actually what's driving a lot of um, this. So most of the fans of K-pop, you have to remember, are not in Korea, actually. <laughs> so most, the, the majority of fans are outside of Korea. Uh, they don't speak or read or write um, in the Korean language. And they don't have very many chances to actually see their favorite band or in kind of K-pop lingo, their idols, right? So they don't get to see their favorite bands or their favorite idols in person uh, very often. So the vast majority of the fandom, of course, was already online, right? Their only way to have access to these groups um, or their idols was actually through technology, right? Um, and so I think technology um, is interesting. And I think the company, Korean companies, production companies have been, been particularly good at figuring out how to use technology, particularly social media and digital technology in order to reach out to the fans and to grow uh, the fandom. And of course they do this because now for most people, technology is very fast and there's easy access around the world. And so this really lowered the barriers for participation in digital technology on platforms like YouTube um, and TikTok where you didn't have to pay and you didn't need a subscription necessarily to participate. But I think the second aspect of the technologies for fans was that it was visually driven. So again, if I'm, um, you know, a, a white girl sitting in Minnesota, but I'm a K-pop fan, you know, and I don't speak Korean, um, the fact that I can watch the music video on YouTube and I can get a lot through uh, through visually rather than just text um, or lyrics, meant that it actually um, allowed even people who didn't understand the lyrics um, to to really appreciate. Uh, the dancing and the musicality, uh, the fashion and the appearance, particularly, I think, um, of K-pop idols. Um, and of course, uh, something like YouTube is also user generated content driven. So a lot of the fans started making their own videos, reaction videos, uh, copying the dance videos. Um, and so I think everything from fan fiction on Wattpad to you know, YouTube uh, tribute dances um, or dance flash mobs, um, you see a lot of that kind of user participation actually um, spurred even actually more participation in the K-pop fandom because they could actually participate 
Um, and of course, you have to remember that uh, the vast majority of K-pop fans are under the age of 30. Um, and so these young people are very online, right? They're, they're used to being in what we call a poly media environment. They're used to using many different kinds of, of media and media platforms for different things. So um, I noticed in the Q&A, someone wants us to talk about BTS. So the example of BTS's concert last month, which was their eighth kind of anniversary uh, concert, you get um, fans streaming the concert live on Weverse, which is of course a Korean app with their Bluetooth light sticks uh, linked uh, to you know, 1.3 million people across the world. Um, at the same time, they're having a Zoom streaming video chat with their local fan club members, local army uh, members, uh, that's the name of the fan club of uh, BTS. And at the same time, they're also a lot of them using their phones to take uh, video captures and photograph captures that they'll later upload to their Instagram, Twitter or TikTok accounts. So you can see that, you know, I mean, th these these young people are used to kind of swimming around in this as polymedia environment. And so I think um, because they're very online, um, because they're comfortable in these media environments um, and they also like the fact that there's user generated content. Um, even though they're not in Korea, I think they, they are strong participants. Um, and then the last thing is, of course, uh, what the thing I'm most interested in actually is um, their emotions. So the K-pop fandom is often described as intensely passionate, um, that they're aptly named, BTS's uh, you know, fan groups are aptly named as the army because they operate as an army. Um, and I think uh, what's interesting to me is no matter what the technology or no matter what the, the music, the, the, the same fact remains that the reason that they, a group like BTS are popular is because of the fans and the fans are passionate because they feel emotionally connected to the group. So this effective digital consumption um, is because they feel closer to their K-pop uh, idols or bands than the Western counterparts like Justin Bieber or you know the Swifties for Taylor Swift. And they feel that there's more um, often and better digital kind of social media engagement from the stars or the bands to their fans than their Western counterparts. Yeah, this is a perfect transition um, because you're talking about uh, online concerts. You mentioned BTS's recent online concert, which obviously right now we can only have online concerts um, in most parts of the world. Um, so, you know, starting in 2020, um, the industry and the fandom had to switch to fully online events. But as you both have mentioned, we were kind of primed to do that. The industry was primed to do that. They had this digital technology available and they had a fandom that was generally um, used to consuming things digitally. So what, what has been the reaction like? Um, I'll start with um, Dr. Park on the industry side and then we'll talk about fans as well. How have things been going since um, the last year and a half, this switch to completely digital um, K-pop? Um, I mean, I think, you know, there is no arguing um, that the success of the, the success of this, um, I think it used to be that um, both kind of cultural pop cultural pundits and also business people used to kind of poo poo K pop as, oh, a flash in the pan with, you know, kind of screening teenagers, um, it, it won't last. I think that's that's gone out the window. I mean, um, I just looked up a big hit or Hybe as it's now known, which is BTS's company. Um, their profits for the first quarter in this year were up 29%, having had almost an entire year online for a revenue of 161 million US dollars. So yeah, I think it's pretty successful. <laughs> I think we can, it's undoubtedly successful and has been, as Jenna said, in the last year with digitization. Um, and I think part of this is, is, as Jenna mentioned, I think overseas fans certainly were already primed. Um, they were already on multiple platforms following um, their band, the favorite bands. They were already watching online meet and greets, um, video clips of concerts. Um, everything was online, you know, even the backstage, you know, kind of uh, glimpses, video glimpses, um, it was all uh, digitized. And I think that the um, companies were very clever. They were very quick to move online and the concerts were very, very well done. The production value was really high. It's very slick. And I think for the companies, you know, 
Um, being online meant they had an unlimited stadium space, right? You could, I mean, there was no social distancing. There wasn't a limit on how many tickets you could sell. Um, and so you get like the, literally the biggest audience in the world. And again, BTS last month, right? 1.33 million paid viewers of their concert from over 195 countries over two days. Like, I mean, you, they, they set a world record. You kind of, I, I think other um, industries haven't been able to compete with this. And so I think it's because they were they were ready, they were primed on the tech pl fat platforms, but also because of the way that it was packaged um, to an already kind of very online uh, group of people. Um, talking about the from business side, it's very interesting to see you know, what is going on after COVID, okay? But basically, um, well, the people, they cannot move around. And then it is difficult to have concert, you know? So, you know, there's a two kinds of movements. The first one is like, you know, the companies, they try to be, uh, they try to localize themselves. You know, already like Becky, you know, said, for example, like a BTS, the BTS entertainment, you know, they try to make it bigger. And then they also, you know, uh, emanate with American companies. So they set up, you know, hype. So that means basically, not just using Korean talent in the United States, but they also want to utilize the American talents in the United States. Also companies, so some, you know, for example, SM Entertainment, they went to in the China and then they are not using actual Korean talent, but they are using Chinese talent. So they make, you know, Chinese local idol group that they are using talent. So again, you have to see from business side and then you you, you know that it's totally different. It's not just about Korea, it's not just about Korea, but it is, you know, for company itself. Another interesting thing is like online, you know, as you know, Rebecca already explained, because um, the Korean pop groups, they gained a lot of, you know, population from here and there, which means basically, you know, it generates a lot of profits and then they do have a lot of fan base. So that means basically for them, they are free to utilize a lot of different you know, technologies. It doesn't matter if this is old and new or it's traditional or innovative, you know, they try to utilize this one and they can observe the reaction from other, you know, fandoms. So this way, you know, they say, okay, this is well accepted, this one is not, then why don't we utilize this one, you know, for the next time? So, you know, this kind of a lot of, you know, trial and errors, and it helps the Korean music industry go beyond, you know, their stages. Another interesting thing is that actually during the COVID, you know, you, People they talk about you know the number of you know fandom for, for Korean music industry increased significantly. It's basically online like YouTube and Facebook. A lot of Korean you know K-pop content were available online, and then people they are you know looking at it. But from business side, for example, like a, you know Google, YouTube, and Facebook, that they are always looking for you know generating more profits. And then they already know that you know if they show K-pop contents. And there's a lot of people who want to click it, which means basically it, it's you know automatically linked to watching you know advertisement. So you know recommending Korean you know uh, music video or Korean content, it helps you know generating their profits. So they are willing to you know recommend in you know, the K-pop video more and more. So you know you can see this kind of thing. Another thing very interesting um, when it comes to each member of the band, you know. Long, long time ago, people they talk about oh this band they dance a lot, they dance really well, or they sing really well. Oh, he's handsome, she's pretty, or this kind of things. But recently, if you go over YouTube video clips, actually they, they do not talk about only you know this kind of things, but they also talk about other things. For example, oh this guy is cool, you know, like Jimmy Park, you know, from BTS is very kind, he dances well, he's very sweet, you know, this kind of thing. And, you have to understand how people got to know about his personality, you know? So this is also related to copyright, you know? So basically, fandoms, they watch Korean dramas or Korean entertainment, you know, variety shows, and then they copy and then they just put some, you know, clips and then they share it. So basically, this is not just about the singing or dancing, but also the way they talk, the way they do, you know, a lot of, you know, activities. So these kind of things can be easily diffused through internet. And then, especially during the pandemic situation, people, they are looking at it, looking at it. And then you watch k more, then, you know, you can see a lot, you can be exposed to a lot of different contents. So it helps people, you know, to get into you know, K-pop more than before.
Yeah, I think that's really fascinating. I'm glad you mentioned um, because I've had this personal experience. I've been a, a fan and, and been interested in K-pop for 10 years now, which is crazy to think about. Um, but I have several friends who have become interested during the pandemic and it's partially because the access is so easy. Um, for example, I will be watching you know, an online concert or I'll plan to watch an online concert and I'll you know, just kind of ask my friends, do you wanna watch with me? I'm, I'm paying for it anyway. You know, Do, do you wanna take the second login? Cause usually you pay for one ticket and two people can watch it at the same time. And, um, and then after that, oh, do you wanna know more about them? I'll go on YouTube and send a link, you know, 10 things you need to know about this group or this person. And, and it's really very easy to get so much information. And uh, um, as you mentioned, Dr. Park, it really is very fan driven and, and fans will spend a lot of time putting together every single clip to show the key points of person's personality, as well as their singing or dancing abilities. Um, so this, this community aspect, the communal aspect um, that um, Dr. King Arun also mentioned is really important uh, um, between fans, um, as well as between fans and the group uh, that, they're, that they're interested in. So um, this has really become, I think, even more heightened during the pandemic. Um, so in addition to online concerts, um, have you seen any other interesting trends from the industry side or within fans, um, within fandom that have arisen because of the switch to totally digitized content? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of see two trends. Um, uh, the first, of course, is um, as technology advances, um, Korean companies are very well positioned to take advantage of that. And we see evidence of this already. So in the online concert realm, you saw, for example, the using of things like augmented reality or virtual reality. Um, so this idea of like in the online concerts, you know, it, it's not just a backdrop now, but it's using immersive technologies in order to stage the design or design the stage or, you know, they're not just an outer space kind of backdrop. They're in outer space, you know, in the, um, in the concert. And so I think that use of virtual reality or augmented reality is already happening actually. So I think these kind of technological trends will continue to happen. Um, the other one that I see is uh, of course is the use of artificial intelligence. Um, so if you look at a group like ESPA, for example, which is a, a, a girls uh, K-pop group with four members, um, they have the four members, you know, so they have Karina and Winter and Ning Ning, but they also have avatars of so it's AE Karina, AE Ning Ning, AE Winter, you know, so they have the, the real people and then they have also the avatars and together they make the group uh, ESPA. So that that's quite interesting, you know, to see them pushing. Um, I know JYP in your clip, Jimin said that, you know, he was going to invest in humans. Now we have actually investing in non-humans, right? The avatars are going to be the idols, not the actual um people, which I think, to be totally honest with you, is probably a lot easier for the uh, production companies to manage because there are no dating scandals or <laughs> um, anything like that. When you're dealing with an av avatar, there's nothing messy, um, but it's also not human. Um, and so I'm not sure that the fans are actually going to go for that because in my research anyway, uh, um, fans are, you know, they're driven by the human side of it. The emotional side of it actually is the key a component. The second thing I would say is I think the K-pop has had a huge impact on notions of masculinity across the world. Um, so we see new models of masculinity. And um, when I show clips of, say, K-pop uh, boy groups or male groups um, to Westerners, so in Europe and also in the United States, the first response that I always get, almost always without fail, is they are wearing um, earrings and jewelry and they're wearing tons of makeup and they have pink hair and they look like girls. Are they gay? Right. Um, and so I think, again, this is this is a real, uh, really different model of of masculinity than maybe exists and uh, particularly in the Western world um, in terms of the kind of macho man uh, image that you, you know, and I think that it's really interesting. It's also a very different view of Asian men that existed in this kind of 70s, 80s and 90s of the nerdy, you know, glasses wearing, you know, electrical engineering student at Berkeley. Um, now we have, you know, 
they're, they're super attractive, they're physically very fit, um, they're sleekly dressed. And this idea of the flower boy or the pretty boy has, I think, really challenged that macho, hegemonically masculine image. And certainly when we interview fans, one of the main reasons they like a, a band like BTS is um, that they are okay with being, you know, kind of feminine uh, masculine men. Um, and that that is, you know, is totally normal and is accepted and is, they're kind of fed up with toxic, toxic, you know, kind of hegemonic macho masculinity. And that's one of the reasons they like K-pop. Um, so I think technology and masculinity, but Jimin, what do you think? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that's very interesting aspect. Um, right. Um, you highlighted about the AR, uh, AI, and then uh, AR. Anyway, I'm going to be here, and then I'm going to talk about another thing. Um, nowadays, you know, before Korean companies, they want to work on their, you know, on their own. Okay, they would, they prefer not to have collaboration, except as you, uh, SM Entertainment. Um, well, what they have done is actually, you know, it's a, it was, uh, it began before pandemic, you know, SM Entertainment, they have a lot of collaboration with, you know, international uh, songwriters, you know, especially from, you know, the Scandinavian countries, like Danish, Finnish, and Swedish. So they collaborate a lot. So a lot of people, they believe that this is K-pop and from Korea, but also, you know, a lot of SM Entertainment, you know, the band's music, it actually, they were written by Swedish or Finnish songwriters. It's very internationalized. Uh, more recently, uh, if you see it, uh, the Korean company do a lot of collaboration with American companies. For example, as you know, like the Jimmy Fallon show TV, you know, they had like a BTS week. So, you know, basically BTS, they make their own music video in Seoul, and then they send it to, you know, the um, Jimmy Fallon show. And then Jimmy Fallon, you know, they tried to broadcast this kind of thing. So you can see there is a lot of collaboration. Um, regarding the masculinity and then, well, that one is very interesting, especially, you know, me, you know, I am in France and the people, they talk about these kind of things, you know. Um, let me share another, you know, PowerPoints, you know, which can be interesting. See? Okay. So basically, you know, if you know, you know, like, a, you know, the BTS and people, if you, if you find a guy who is wearing like a pink and the people there said, they said, okay, there is some kind of, you know, things that are going on and then, you know, we don't, we don't know what's going on, right? So they talk about this kind of things, but actually, you know, if you know the whole story, it is very different actually, okay? Um, nowadays, people believe that pink, that is for lady, but until 18th century in Europe, pink was only for men, okay? So this is a symbol of virility and masculinity, which is very different from us, uh, our time. Another interesting, okay? Let's say if you saw a guy who has a lot of big ribbons around him, you may think like a he, you know, you 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 ask about you know his um, the sexual orientation, okay? Um, well, actually, I took this one from uh, at the um, Louvre Museum, okay, in front in, in Paris. So this is guy. This guy is Molière. So it's a famous, you know. Uh, 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 novelist. So basically, at his time, you know, it is kind of you know uh, normal. That a lot of guys just you know having a lot of ribbon around you know people, and also at the time, you know, these guys they picked a lot of you know makeup. Okay? So basically, people they are arguing. Okay, BTS or in you know, a Korean you know K-pop you know idols, masculinity problem. It, they call it problem. I call it. It's just trend. It's a trend is changing. Sometimes it you know. You see, this is a lot of different things going on. And then as, you know, Rebecca Lee mentioned, if we compare with, you know, like the you know, Western man and the Asian man, you believe that Korean or Asian people can have a lot of beards like Western, you know, guys, or they can have a lot of muscles just like in Western guys. You know, it's very different. What I see from, in you know, the K-pop industry, I, I would say from economic perspective, it's more like a specialization. I mean, it's basically, we do what we can do best, you know. So, you know, this is what we can do it. And we know that, you know, we we care about, you know, beauty. We do care about the dress or something like that. So this is why, you know, they focus on this kind of things, group dance as well. 
Right, so um, we actually have gotten a, a couple of questions about this both in advance, but also I'm seeing a couple of these in the Q&A. So I, I wanna ask you if you see any drawbacks to some of this, to this digitization movement, to the trends you just mentioned, AI, et cetera, um, or just places to kind of keep an eye on moving forward um, now that we are kind of in this more uh, digitized space. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the first thing I would say is that um, I, there seem to be a lot of questions actually coming into the chat about why, you know, it's so um, popular. And certainly the fans say uh, that part of the reason they're so dedicated and it's so popular is because the fan service or or from a company perspective, fan first production is is what they like about it, is they feel that they actually matter as fans. Um, and, uh, and of course, they matter because, um, you know, if if one of the idols or if one of the companies has a scandal, the stock market prices drop immediately. Um, and so they're quite, um, uh, they're quite careful actually about the content that it, um, gets put out because they are publicly floated. Many of them are publicly floated um, uh, companies. But I, for my research anyway, I think one of the big things of course is this kind of parasocial relationship uh, that fans have with their kind of idols or their favorite groups. And by that, I mean, it's sort of a, it's not a new idea, right? The Beatles or One Direction, um, that there's a pseudo intimate kind of fairly one way relationship from the fans to the idols. Um, in K-pop, you also get the idols talking a lot about, um, you know, when they get asked questions like, who's your girlfriend or what kind of, what's your ideal type? A lot of them will say, uh, it's the fans, you know, I, I love the fans, I want to date the fans, I want to, you know, my ideal type is the fans. And so they often reflect it back to uh, the fans. But I would worry a little bit about that parasocial one way, uh, very passionate relationship. Um, and particularly over the last year, because fans have been stuck in their bedrooms um, on the computer, uh, we see that, of course, fans can drive the success um, of a group like BTS, winning them the Billboard Social Award several years in a row um, and winning, you know, world records in terms of support. But I think being just on your computer and only relating through digitized or mediatized, uh, you know, kind of ways does bring a fairly uh, narrow and technologically mediated view of the world, which for many is um, kind of a fantasy. Uh, and so this is why fans get upset when their idol starts actually dating or marry someone um, is because in their fantasy world, they were the potential um, girlfriend or everyone's the potential, all, you know, 10 million of them are the potential girlfriends, um, right? But I think for some fans that's maintained possibly beyond where it, it, it's maybe healthy for it um, to be. Um, and to remember, of course, that that content that they're viewing is very carefully curated. Even the behind the scenes stuff is very carefully uh, curated um, and performed. And also it's a business. So, um, you know, the business wants you to keep coming back. And um, I think Jimin's thing is right that actually the companies have figured out and every time a digitized interaction, social interaction goes on, even if it's motivated by parasocial relationship or, you know, kind of love and adoration, uh, those companies are recording all that big data and using that in order to target their marketing and to figure out how to better um, recruit uh, more members. Um, I think the other thing is that um, having said that, being worried about people's kind of emotional relationship only through technology, I have to say in my research before the pandemic in person at like local fan meetups and cup sleeve events and K-pop discos and concerts that actually the fans, when they meet other fans in real life, actually also form relationships with each other. And for me, that's quite positive. Um, so the digitize, I would worry, but I think the in real life stuff has been really interesting because there are a lot of people of color, uh, gay, lesbian, and even what I would call neurodiverse fans that have kind of fallen under the fandom and have kind of found each other through digital media. Um, and they work very well together, as we found out last summer, of course, when they uh, punked the Trump rally in Tulsa and bought out all the tickets, never intending to show up, or uh, when they jammed, you know, the Dallas uh, Police Department, um, who were trying to crack down on illegal protest activities for the Black Lives Matter, K-pop fans and TikTokers got online and spammed and crashed the system. So it's very clear that they can work together, um, both digitally and in real life, but I would worry a little bit about the kind of mediatized um, 
kind of relationships. And then this, kind of the last thing I would be worrying about is um, I think the work conditions um, within for the actual artists themselves, I would worry. Um, it's, it's very difficult to get access to figure out what those exactly are or what the contracts actually say, what the percentage of the profits actually are. And I would be worrying about the work conditions, particularly the mental health um, of many of the artists, as I think we have seen. I, I mean, I don't want to focus. I mean, that happens in every industry, I would say, across the world. We saw it in the Olympics this week, right, of course, with Simone Biles. Um, but I think, um, ag again, I think that, that we, we need to think about, you know, the working conditions and keeping everybody healthy, um, including the fans, while it's going on. Sorry, that was sort of long. Before COVID, you know, I traveled here and there in order to talk about, you know, give lecture about the K-pop and Korean drama and the film industry. One thing, you know, I, um, I was often asked that is about the uh, dick back backlash of K-pop. But the thing is like, you know, um, well, well, from my view, it is more like a company. They try to focus on their business. So this is why they promote their group and they work with others. Okay. However, somehow Korean government is using PayPal and they said we helped. They try to give some kind of message that behind the success of PayPal, there is a you know Korean companies. And then actually I feel this is very dangerous. For example, like in 2012, at the time PayPal was very popular in Korea. And then in order to uh, detour some domestic problem at the time, the president even visited. Uh, the Tokyo or from Japanese view is, is Akishima, and this is a, an island between Korea and Japan. So he decided to visit, and then you know it became like a huge problem. And then a lot of Japanese, you know, K-pop fandom, they said, okay, this is not really good. This is very disappointing. And then there was kind of anti K-pop or anti Hallyu movement, you know. Another thing is like after 2017, when Korean government decided to uh, deploy the you know the U.S. missile in Korea, we, are, we what we call like a bad the issue. But at the time, you know, there is a huge backlash in China. Okay, so I said like if the Korean government didn't utilize or did not exploit K-pop, you know, I'm sure the Korean music industry did not have this kind of problem. Okay, so this one, you know, like behind. You know, the, the success, Korean government always argued, it is us, we try to help, you know, we are the one who helped the emergence of K-pop, so this is one thing. Another thing that I um, focused, uh, I, I got asked a lot, that is about the fandom. The, well, a lot of people in uh, South you know, East Asia, like Vietnam and Thailand, they often ask me, okay, this is not for guy, you know, K-pop, it is only female, and then they just like K-pop, and that's it. But then, in fact, this is not correct. Actually, I met also a lot of American, you know, male and then heterosexual, and they said, I like BTS, I like, you know, Blackpink. And they said, I think it's okay, but if I said I like BTS, then this is a problem. So they said, you know, they are like a shy hip hop fan, you know, a lot of guys, so they don't talk about it. But one thing very interesting when, you know, the male, Guys, they just go to you know soccer game, football game, and then after that there is a huge riot or fighting, whatever. The newspapers they don't talk about this one, okay? But when they see there is a lot of female young ladies, you know, go to a stadium to see BTS concert, uh, I mean BTS concert or something, then the newspaper they argue, okay, this is something, you know, this is very strange. There's a full of you know ladies. Okay, so I think that, uh, you know, this is kind of, you know, the media, of course, they try to attract attention from others. So they are just highlighting this kind of thing that are, you know, problem. So I see, you know, this kind of things is a kind of problem though. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this. It's, it's a, um, especially recently, um, this has come up a lot on a lot of fandom spaces. Why are we always talked about in this way? Like we're crazy fans, we're just going to a concert and enjoying ourselves. Um, but I also find it, it reminds me also of, of interesting conversations. Um, and we have a couple of questions in the chat about this as well. People are always really curious, you know, why K-pop? Why, why do people like it so much? What is it about this, 
you know, this content that people love so much. And personally, and, and please feel free to, you know, agree or disagree. There's a lot of stuff you can say about the way that technology emerged, the way that politics um, changed in Korea that affected the music industry coming from the 80s to the 90s to today. Um, I think all of those things play an important role, but I also think it's important to remember that, that it's also really good right? Like it's good music, it's good dancing. Um, it's really, you know, innovative sometimes in terms of genre and, and trying new things with technology, things like that. So um, just pointing out, you know, I, as, as both of you have kind of said, there's a lot of reasons between, you know, why people have really gotten pulled into these interesting fan communities. But we also have to bring it back to the fact that the content itself is actually just very good as well. Um, so yes, I, I don't know if you have any um, thoughts on that. Um, oh, I think I, I think you, you've hit on something really important, Jenna, which is it's and G mentioned this as well. It's an interesting combination, though, because it's very clear to me, for example, that in a lot of the K-pop music, it's very hip hop, right, um, and rap driven. So it's it, it's African American music, right? It's an African American music genre that gets. Um, you know, I mean, some people would say appropriated, other people would say, you know, they're respecting the tradition and they're trying to build on it, you know, um, in terms of uh, African American hip hop and, and rap music. Um, but what what I think I really see is it's, you know, youth culture now is based around hip hop and rap across the world. Um, and they do it um, incredibly well. And the synchronized dancing and all of that stuff, again, you can see that it's very global actually. And I think a lot of people really like it, but a lot of fans also really like it because it's different. And, and that's the, the K in K-pop. I mean, there are some people who argue that there is no K in K-pop. It's actually not Korean. I, I would, I would uh, kind of disagree. I actually think there is something quite culturally Korean about it. And I think that's what drives a lot of fans to like it because it is Korean and it is different. Um, you know, and, you know, we've interviewed people from, you know, rural Wisconsin who um, the only way they can have access to this is through YouTube, but they're hugely dedicated fans and they're teaching themselves Korean and they dream of, you know, flying or, or visiting Korea someday. So in that sense, I think um, it is both kind of exotic and different and also the same at the same time. One thing I, I really want to pick up on also is something that Dr. Park, um, you mentioned the role of the Korean government, and we've had a lot of interest about this as well. Um, I mean, the concept of Hallyu, the Korean wave, being driven in part, um, at least initially, by the Korean government very um, strongly. So I'm, I'm curious to ask about this, especially in this time of a pandemic, um, when everything is digitized, everything is online. Um, what do you see um, about the role of the, the Korean government in creating kind of the soft power for Korea through Hallyu during this pandemic period? Okay. Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, first, I want to share, you know, one slide. Okay, I will not play any music here, but, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot of people who love, you know, classical music, okay? Um, I just wonder if there's anyone who have heard the terminology like A classical music or G classical music and I classical music. I just wonder if there's anyone, okay? Probably not because I'm the one who invented this kind of terminology. For me, A classical music means basically classical music produced in Austria. And G classical music means classical music produced in Germany. And I classical music means classical music produced in you know, Italy. But I wonder, you know, is there anyone who listens to classical music because this is from, you know, Austria, this is from Germany, or this is from, you know, Italy, okay? So actually, when you enjoy music, you do not think about the nationality, but you enjoy just music because you like it, okay? Well, here, I just put three songs, but I will not play it, okay? The first one is BTS, okay, Dynamite. And the second one is Mic Drop, Japanese version. And then the third one is Mic Drop, um, or Korean version. Okay, the interesting thing is all of three is a song by BTS, but the Dynamite it is classified as American pop, okay? And then Mic Drop, Japanese version, is classified as Japanese uh, J-pop. And then the last one, of course, this is K-pop, okay? So basically, you know, people, they like this kind of things because they love the music, because the quality is good, 
because of the, you know, they dance well, and then they are pretty, and then they are cool, okay? As Jen already mentioned. So, you know, the connection between, you know, the government, you know, the national like Korea, and this one, you have to think about different way around, okay? Now, what I talk is about the music, okay, the musical side. Now, if you think about, you know, the appearance, like a dance move and makeup and dress, and then as it's this is completely Korean thing. So this one is the aspect that you have to think about Korea. Okay, so this is basically, um, you have to think about this kind of way, you know. Um, the, why K-pop is really popular? Because of, you know, the way people consume music is different. Basically, a long time ago, it was more like, you know, Walkman or radio. So basically, what you listen to, that is basically, you know, the music itself, or sometimes lyrics, okay? So American people, they said, okay, I understand people enjoy, you know, American pop music or music in English, but I can understand why people enjoy K-pop because they don't understand Korean language. The thing is, like, you have to understand twice. Okay, you just see things in United States. If you see our things out of the United States, it's very different story. For example, my parents' age, when they were young in 1960s, they enjoy, you know, American pop, not because they can understand 100% of the lyrics, but they love the music because it is cool. Once they love the music, then they say, oh, I really, really want to know the meaning, you know, what they are singing for. Okay, then they study English, try to find some words on, in dictionary, and then they find, oh, okay, that's, this is the meaning. Okay, the K-pop has exactly the same, you know, uh, per, the, uh, the path. So few people, they just love the dance moves and then the music. And then there are some people who is interested, okay, what are you talking about? I just want to know, you know, the language. So they just study and then they share. So these kind of things you know, happen a lot. Now, or what I tried to do was like disconnecting the nationality and the music, okay? Because of the government. If you know the whole history of you know, the Korean music industry since uh, 1950s, so after Korean War, okay? The Korean War is very important because before we have some music which is called like a trot, okay? This is very similar to Kenpa, it's the Japanese music. So it's more like a mixture of local traditional music and American fast folk, okay? And then after 1950s, basically Korea was poor and people, they don't have any money to enjoy music. For them, just living for, you know, for day is very difficult. So no time to enjoy entertainment at all. But at the time for musicians, the only way they can make money, this is like a performance on US army base. Okay, so that means basically at the time the consumer is U.S. soldiers, young soldiers. So the musicians they had to accept or adapt American style of music. Okay, so this is what happened in 1970s. There's a very interesting thing. Basically, government they were against this kind of music. They said this is not Korean traditional thing, and that this is uh, destroying the Korean spirit or Korean tradition. So this is not good. But people love to listen to this kind of you know, American music. In 1970s, because of copyright, the American companies, they said, oh, no, 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 this is not good. You just make a lot of piracy, and then no good, no good. And the Korean music industry they adapted a lot of things from Europe. So basically, based on American influence, there's a lot of European influence in Korea. And then in 1990s, of course, it's J-pop, okay? So we are adopted a lot. So basically, we are globalizing, update, 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 we accepted the most popular thing at the time, okay? And then now this is the K-pop, okay? This is why people love it, okay? Now, people always try to connect Korean government and then K-pop. Now, let me tell you something different. If it is not K-pop, but it is like, you know, sports player, like a tennis player, okay? Or like a music, uh, music industry, if it was really well known, and I'm sure then Korean government utilize you know, tennis player or, you know, the actor and actresses, then they try to connect this one with soft power, okay? So whenever there is something and the government, they try to utilize this kind of things, okay? So what I want to do is like, you know, although we got a lot of impression that behind, you know, the success of K-pop, there is a government, but the connection is very loose. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would agree with Jim and I think soft power, I mean, it's working, right? Um, you know, people, tourist numbers before the pandemic, tourist numbers are up uh, of, you know, particularly Western tourists wanting to go to Korea, driven in large part by consumption of uh, K-pop. You know, BTS is speaking in the UN and President Moon has made them, you know, a special envoy. Um, so they are actually out there doing international relations type work. Um, people want to buy Korean products. It's not just K-pop, of course. In the chat, it's pointed out, you know, uh, certainly health and beauty products, uh, your Samsung phone, your car, you know, you know. So I think um, it's it's working in that sense. But I think one of the things we kind of can't uh, forget is that soft power is still linked to hard power in the Korean context. So um, yes, even BTS will have to serve in the South Korean military um, eventually, and. And I think that, you know, again, you know, that tax money, it goes back into the government, which has to fund a military presence um, because of their, uh, you know, troubled relationship with the North, um, you know, something in, that we understand in Ireland, <laughs> you know. Um, and so I think uh, soft power, yeah, I think it's working, but I also think we have to remember the context in which that it's um, actually functioning. Okay, so I think we're going to start to um, head into a couple of audience questions and then we'll wrap up our discussion for today. We've covered a lot so and we have a lot of great questions too. So I apologize if we don't get to your question. I think we've covered a lot of great topics here. So hopefully, um, hopefully people have learned a lot. I know I have. So um, I'm going to pick a couple of questions here and then and then we'll finish up our, our conversation. Um, we had uh, several questions people were asking about something that I believe um, Dr. King O'Rean you mentioned with um, the idols themselves, mental health um, concerns about you know fans being a little bit too connected or or even you know going so far as to stalk these idols, right? We had several questions about that. So um, if you have any thoughts about, especially with this even stronger parasocial relationship that you mentioned. Um, how do you, you know, make sure that, that stars are getting the, the health, the mental health um, support that they need um, and that, that fans kind of are, are able to keep their distance? Yeah, I mean, you have to remember the word stan, as far as I understand, it comes from stalker and fan being put together. And, you know, Korean stands, um, which are, you know, the people that you support or the people you're fans of. Yeah, it can in, engage very intense emotional engagement um, with, uh, with the stars. But I think, again, I think there are cultural differences in the interpretation of the division between public and private. Um, you know, and I, I think that uh, it's possible that particularly Western fans may not understand that in Korea there is a division between public and private too, and that there is a, often a private life that is going on that is actually not on screen really. Um, and I think that gets ruptured when you get these kind of scandals, if you will, um, where they're kind of, you know, their real life or their real life actions start to come out into, into the public sphere and, and fans get very, very um, upset. Uh, you know, and I obviously that's that's not great. And I, I do think, again, like BTS really uh, they broke the mold last summer. Right. They said they were going on vacation. That has never really happened before. And I think that was very positive. I was quite disappointed, though, that they continued to tweet on Twitter, um, the museums they were going to. And, you know, I wish it had been actually a real um, a, a decision to actually disconnect totally for, you know, a period of time, because I think it's good for fans to realize that um, if their idols do it, then maybe they would do it too, that it, it's actually not a bad idea to take breaks from time to time and, um, you know, and actually take time out for your own mental health. But I thought that was a very positive move uh, by them, unprecedented, really. Well, let me, let me um, tell you something more about this one. Um, let me share another one. People, they say like, okay, the mental health and the attachment, but you know, if you know the whole history in the world, and then you can see actually there's a similar case in Western Europe as well. For example, like, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the French, Asian, German, it's a bad okay, the virtual fever. I'm sure that you know this kind of things, okay? So it was probably, it was written by Goethe, and then, you know, it was really, really popular in Europe, okay? So be basically, you know, they can see, you know, the people they are wearing the, um, you know, something different from the others. So they try to copy the way, you know, the the main characters dress up. Okay, so that's what they did. Of course, government didn't like it, this kind of things. Another thing, you know, because of the story, you know, it was really really sad. And in the end, you know, there's some people 
uh, the person who committed suicide. And then after that, the people, they just follow the exact same thing. Okay. So from this one, you know, it's not just, you know, very, you know, K-pop phantom uniqueness. Okay. But it's more like, you know, it's like a global kind of manner. Okay. Whenever there is something new or something different, when people, they have tendency to fall in love with, you know, that one, then, you know, they just mimic the exact same thing. Okay. Okay, um, finally, I, I think we have um, a couple of questions about, you know, kind of K-pop versus, you know, either American pop music or, or other types of, of pop music, how K-pop was able to transition so quickly as we discussed to this, you know, more online world that we're living in right now. Um, and also the way that, that Korean fandoms um, has have been more developed um, than perhaps Western music fandoms. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and what that means for um, both the industry and fans, especially as we you know, hopefully transition out of a pandemic situation soon? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some things that are going to remain. Um, you know, I noticed a question in there about K-pop fan signs online. That's something I could see them hanging on to because you can certainly cycle through more people faster without the trouble of travel and queuing and all this kind of stuff. Um, but by just doing it on Zoom, you know, um, like academic conferences. I mean, I, again, I think there are other things that will probably change um, and be a hangover. I, I don't see it totally being replaced, though, by technology. I think the fans still would prefer to meet the, meet the idol in person, to go to the concert in person, and that collective consciousness or you almost euphoria you feel at the concert. Um, I think people, you know, at the bottom line is there people are human and they want the human connection. And I think that's what really drove the last year is the, the need for um, content and also human connection. And again, K-pop was well positioned because their fan service was already so diverse and so constant. I mean, you literally could be receiving content um, from your fate from Monster X or 17 around the clock um, in terms of 24 hours, seven days a week, there would be new content posted. And if you're on multiple platforms, um, it's almost hard to keep up um, because there's so much. So I think that's very different than the American um, fan context. And so you get K-pop fans actually defying um, behavioral scientists who've measured market behaviors. So uh, K-pop fans actually buy CDs and albums, even though they don't need to, because they can stream on Spotify or on Apple Music, right? But they buy it because they want to support their band, right? Or their favorite. Um, and they also want the little merch inside. They want the photo cards and the badges and the, you know, stickers. Um, and I think that, the, again, um, that's why the K-pop fan, it, it, it is different um, culturally and there's involvement at every stage. So even when you go to the concerts, there's fan chants, right? So the fans participate in the concert, chanting back and forth, back and forth between the artists and themselves. And that, um, well, recreated online, it wasn't quite the same, I don't think. Yeah, if I can just jump in and then I'll go to Dr. Park. I'm very curious your thoughts too. Completely agree, it, you know, having done some research on this and talked to a lot of fans who attended um, online concerts or chose not to attend online concerts, for a lot of them, it was kind of, well, this is what we have for now and it's amazing that we have it and I will absolutely, you know, consume this content and I, and it's, I appreciate it during a time of a pandemic, but as soon as there is a concert in person, I'm there. Like the moment that it happens, I'm there. Or, or even fans who haven't attended in-person concerts before or don't necessarily want to sometimes travel quite far or can't travel far to attend an in-person concert, they would even express that it's different watching a video of a concert that took place in person. Even if it's still them watching a video, they can feel the difference in energy from the audience, from the um, artists themselves. They can see something different about a recording of a live in-person concert versus a recording of a COVID, you know, fully digital online concert with no audience whatsoever. So it is really interesting to see. And I think that going forward, there will have to be some, you know, hybrid or, you know, some sort of model that allows those fans to have that human connection, like you were saying, that I, I think fans really are craving, especially as we get into 18 months plus of this pandemic now. Um, 
So yes, Dr. Park, what do you what do you think about uh, how how we're moving forward? I totally agree with you. And then what Rebecca said, you know, human touch is very important for this kind of thing, especially here. I mean, at this moment, you know, what we feel is we need to we need to be there, you know, being in concert or and uh, you know, being in front of TV or you know, computer is completely different. With the current technology, you know, there's nothing better than con the actual concert. So, you know, I think you know, for a while, although, you know, COVID is there and it's kind of difficult to move around, you know, across the world, whatever, but still people prefer to have concert. Unless there's something new, which has more value than concert. So we don't know exactly what it can be. Obviously, uh, I agree with you. Another, just you know, adding thing, um, while I was doing some research about the industries, you know, um, because of the COVID, there's a very interesting aspect in pay, uh, Korean pop music industry. They know in the, the Korean music industry already said like, you know, for the next two or three years, it is kind of hard to have new groups or to have concert, okay? So what they are doing currently is they are collecting or recruiting a lot of trainees who are much younger than before. Because you know they want to debut these groups, you know, like two years or three years later. Okay. So which means basically maybe after COVID, when it is completely finished, the age group of K-pop band can be much younger than before. Okay. This is bad. Well, I don't think this is bad. You know, this is not again, the industry changed and the people they also change. So we we don't know exactly, you know, what's gonna happen. But anyway, there's something, but Still, human touch is very, very important, you know, and still you have to think about this one. All right, well, we have we could talk about this all day, of course, and, and all of us do often talk about these things all day, um, but I think we should stop there. Um, thank you so, so much for, um, for your great insights, both of our panelists. Thank you for attending, and I'm going to throw it over to Gigi to wrap us up. Jenna, Dr. Ko King Orien, and Dr. Park, thank you for the lively discussion this evening. I've seen a lot of quality comments and questions coming in from our Facebook streaming and also from uh, our Zoom audience. Um, this discussion has surely brought insights on how K-pop has got to where it is and what lies ahead. And most importantly, we have explored an aspect of popular culture from an academic perspective. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we have a brief poll on tonight's program for the audience on Zoom. If you are watching us on Facebook or YouTube, you can leave your answers in the comments below as well. Uh, while you complete the survey, let me tell you more about our program on Tuesday, August 3rd at 8.30 p.m. Hong Kong time, who will, which we will look at um, the K-drama, the globalization of K-drama, and it will feature scholars and industry experts and how this globalization of K-drama and over the top or OTT media platforms like Netflix have changed the game for K-drama productions. We will also look at some interesting consequences that K-drama consumption has brought to the society and what the future may look like as K-drama continues to attract more investment and viewers around the globe. Make sure to follow us on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube channel, and also UN Campus website for further information. And please register for next Tuesday's event. We look forward to seeing you again on August 3rd. Good night, everyone. <laughs>